Good morning and welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church in our 1045 service. We are so glad to have you. At Christ Pres, we are a group of people who proclaim a hope, we build a home, and we launch a healing, both in our own hearts and the world around us. And we're just so glad to have you, especially if you are in town for the game weekend uh, and visiting us. We always want to say welcome to our visitors. Uh, if you're here and you need um, some more information about who we are, we've got little blue visitors cards that sit right on that circular table right there in the middle of the lobby that we'd love for you to grab and uh, just leave right there on the table or in one of the offertory plates that's right out here. We'd love to let you know a little bit about who we are and figure out a little about who you are. Uh, don't worry, no one will come and visit your home. There won't be some sort of like ceremony of people attacking you. Uh, but we would love to make you aware of the things that are going on in our church. Not the least of which are a couple announcements that are happening this very week. The first of which uh, is uh, what we're calling Bring Your Own Baby. Uh, that is going to be a little uh, time that we're going to spend from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, a couple of mornings uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, for a time just to get to know each other as young mommies. Uh, if you have uh, kids at home and you would enjoy some time uh, uh, just sort of with other mommies your age to sort of hang out and get to know some new people, we're going to use our playground and our nursery for that. It'll be a great, very relaxed time. Uh, you can come for a little while and stay or head on back, however you want to do that. Uh, to get more information on the next play date, uh, just sign up for that group in the Church Center app and you'll get regular email updates uh, from when they are meeting. But come this Tuesday at 9. We'll look forward to seeing you there. Not only that, this coming Wednesday, we will have our second uh, pop-up M&M uh, gathering. Uh, basically, our M&M program has decided to do some uh, individualized experiences for our Wednesday night program, uh, not the least of which is uh, uh, our, our broken down into, into grades M&M. This week, our first and second graders uh, will be having M&M here. It's a great time. We'll serve some pizza. They'll do some singing, uh, have a Bible lesson while they're there. It's a wonderful little time uh, to hang out with kids. That's 5.30 to 6.30 this coming Wednesday. If you got kids that are first grade or second grade, uh, we would love to have you come and join us for M&M Pop-Up while we talk a little bit about the topic of gratitude. Uh, finally, we also want to mention that, believe it or not, it is coming around uh, for Operation uh, uh, Christmas Child, uh, where we pack our boxes that are going to be uh, for uh, the families around the world who actually can't have a Christmas. Uh, we'll have boxes available in the week to come that you can take home. They've got some instructions right in them of what to pack those things full of. And it's just a wonderful way uh, to be able to um, uh, share our excess with those people around the world who might not have the things that we have. Um, this year, our goal is to do 300 boxes. So if you know Sue Caston, she was here in the first service. Uh, she can help you out with anything that you want to know about that. And they would be a great resource to talk to about the ways in which um, uh, you can serve in this particular ministry. So thanks for that. Hey, today, if you're just joining us, we are in the midst of a series through the Ten Commandments. And we come this morning to the fifth commandment that talks about honoring your father and mother in the institution of the family. What we're going to find is, is that the family, the family is God's blueprint for how our humanity is to be structured in vital ways. And what that means is, is that's true of every single person in this room, is you are a member of a family. And the fact that you've come together with what we believe here as the family of God means that we take this very seriously. And what we like to do is to invite our Heavenly Father to actually dwell among us by His Spirit every time His people gather. So I want to invite you to stand with me, if you would, while we read responsively from Psalm 22. And please respond from your program. The psalmist says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob. Glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform for those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. The afflicted, all the ends of the earth shall remember and return to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. 
even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Let's pray together. O great God who is higher than the highest heavens, you who hold the oceans in your hand, you who created the incomprehensible vastness of the universe, you who command the stars to shine and the planets to follow their courses, you who created the wonderment that is this world around us with complexities that will forever baffle the human mind. In all this, Father, you have invited those who have gathered here this morning to call you Father. Though the earth and the heavens cannot contain you, you have dealt tenderly with us. You have brought us to yourself. You have tenderly nurtured us. And you've begun our transformation into the fullness of your likeness. And so for this, O Lord, we draw near to you this morning, asking only this, that we would find you as we do. Let us find you, O Lord, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you be seated? We have this semester been working our way through the Heidelberg Catechism as it teaches us about the meaning behind and the full application of the Ten Commandments. So I would ask you, congregation, what is God's will for you in the Fifth Commandment? That I I honor, honor, love, and and be loyal to my my father and mother and and all those in authority authority over me, that I obey and submit to them as is proper when they they correct correct and punish me, me. and And also that I be patient with with their failings, for through them them God God chooses chooses to rule us. This heavenly family that we have for us brings us into a set of family rules, and one of those is, is we always remain humble. And so what we have in Isaiah chapter 1 is an invitation to understand exactly how we prepare that posture of humility as a family of God when it says this, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. O sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, Offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Those are strong words, words that you only hear spoken in the midst of family, I would argue, which is the reason why we come together to have a corporate confession of sin that we say together Sunday in and Sunday out. And so I would invite you this morning to pray along with me as we confess our sins to God. O oh God. You are the special Father of those who know, love, and honor You. But how little Your undeserved goodness has affected me. How imperfectly have I improved my religious privileges. How negligent have I been in doing good to others. I am before You in my trespasses and sins. Have mercy on me. And may Your goodness bring me to repentance. Help me to hate and forsake every false way, to be attentive to my condition and character, to bridle my tongue, to keep my heart with all diligence, to watch and pray against temptation, to be concerned for the salvation of others, sanctify and prosper my domestic devotion, instruction, discipline, example, that my house may be a nursery for heaven and my church, the garden of the Lord, through Christ and for his sake. Amen. Let's take some time together for a silent confession before the Lord. Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now won't you stand and hear the offer of forgiveness in Christ from 1 Peter chapter 1. 
And Peter says, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through whom him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Our deacon Brian Simmons is going to come and deliver our offertory prayer. Won't you be seated? Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the blessing of this place. Uh, it certainly appears as a city on a hill. We are grateful that uh, the nursery is open to listen to the children laugh as they play. Would you keep us all safe? And would you just continue to use these gifts that we give you to further this kingdom uh, of yours here at Christ Prep? In Christ's name, amen. From the depths of woe I raise to thee the voice of lamentation. Lord, turn a gracious ear to me and hear my supplication. If thou iniquities dost mark our secret sins and misdeeds dark, O oh, who shall stand before thee? shall stand before thee shall stand before thee to wash away the crimson stain grace grace alone availeth our works alas are all in vain and much the best life sight all must alike confess thy might and live alone by mercy trust is in the Lord and not in mine own merit. On him my soul shall rest, his word upholds my fainting spirit. His promised mercy is my fort, my comfort, and my sweet support. I wait much more abounded. His helping love no limit knows our utmost need is sounded. Our shepherd good and true is he who will at last is his will free from all their sin and sorrow. My name is Clay Dabbs. I'm on the session here at uh, Christ Press. It's my privilege this morning to lead us in our 
corporate prayer, so I would ask that you would please join me as uh, we go before the Lord together. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we gather before you this morning along with uh, your people all over the world, and we come before you not as a distant king that has got better things to do or is annoyed, but as a loving father that loves his children. And we come to you in that way through your son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you told us that in your word that you came to be the light in the darkness, not just to testify to the light, but to be the light. I pray that you would be that light for us uh, this morning, uh, whether it's on an individual level, uh, there's some particular darkness in our life. Um, as a church, as a community, as a country, I pray that you would be that light. I pray that this body would be uh, that light in the world in the darkness. We seem to be so angry with each other uh, in our nation, and I just pray that you would bring calm and peace uh, to us, and that as your followers, that we would be that light in the darkness, that we would not contribute to that frustration and that anger and that dissension. We thank you for our members of the week uh, this week, for Doug and Terry Sanford, for their daughter Meredith and Anna Catherine, and uh, their new son-in-law, Austin. And they would just ask, Lord Jesus, that you would grow their faith, that you would be their source of peace and joy in the midst of uh, struggles, that they would know how to love and serve uh, people, those that are in need, and that you would continue to watch over and shepherd uh, Meredith and Austin, their newlyweds, and uh, as well as Anna Catherine, that you would continue to watch over them and guide them. We thank you for the Sanfords for the many years here at Christ Pres, and uh, just thank you for the love that they've shown for this this body. We lift up the Sayers, uh, Errol and Anna and Nora and Lucy, and uh, they're thankful for their jobs. Certainly, we don't take our jobs for granted in a way that we might have uh, this time last year. And so they're thankful for that. And I just, in light of that prayer, I'd lift up all those that have been affected financially uh, from the pandemic, and I just pray that you would, for your grace on them, and that you would help us as a congregation know how to help each other and how to love each other and serve each other in that way. Uh, Anna is in particularly thankful for her healing from recent surgery, and they would continue to pray for their health, in particular Errol if he has uh, difficulties with his sinuses. We just ask for your mercy on them and that. And we thank you for Nora and Lucy and just pray to raise them up to be godly women, to love you and to serve you. We thank you for our missionary of the week, for Brian Sorgenfry and RUF, the campus ministry here at Ole Miss. Thank you for the ministry of RUF and how it's uh, influenced so many people, even in this room and certainly in our congregation and even in my own life. Uh, we thank you for Brian and his service there and that he can report that they've been able to connect uh, with students and gather together uh, in light of the pandemic and just pray that they would be a place where people are welcomed and where the love of Christ is shown and where others are brought in and invited in. And we thank you for Brian and just ask for your blessing on Brian and everything that he, that he does through RUF. We have a number of uh, uh, health concerns among those in our body and those connected to our body and, and I just want to name a few. Uh, we lift up John and Elise Atkins, who uh, were members here for a long time and have since moved to Washington. Uh, Elise recently had a surgery to remove a tumor and, and is now running fever, and we just ask for uh, healing on her and that you would bring healing to her body. And we just ask for your peace for John and Elise and for the Atkins family. We thank you for uh, good news from Thomas Pierce that his mom is no longer on a ventilator and his dad has been released from the hospital. They're still very sick, and we would ask for, you would bring healing on them, but we're thankful for that good news. And we lift up Toby and Patty Griggs as uh, uh, Patty deals with a difficult uh, medical diagnosis, and just, we know, uh, Lord Jesus, that you tell us there's a peace that you offer that is beyond anything that we can explain. It is beyond anything that anything in this world can offer, and I pray that for Toby and Patty. Uh, we certainly pray for healing. But I pray that you would bring peace to, to Toby and Patty in a way that maybe even they don't understand and that you would use the people in this body to bring that peace to them. We just thank you for the Griggs and ask for your mercy and love on them. Finally, we pray for Les as he comes and 
opens your word to us. Lord Jesus, you say that your spirit moves like the wind. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and move through us and move through less and speak to us. Open our hearts to hear what you would have us to hear. And we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is from Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The word of the Lord. Yeah, so I mentioned a couple of months ago an article uh, written by my uh, favorite New York Times columnist, David Brooks, uh, that was entitled, The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake. Now granted, it's a provocative title for sure, but he summarizes what he sees as the problem for modern families in this way. He says, the problem is, is that we've made life freer for individuals and more unstable for families. We've made life better for adults, but worse for children. We've moved from big, interconnected, and extended families, which help protect the most vulnerable in society from the shocks of life, to smaller, detached, nuclear families, a married couple and their children, which only give the most privileged people in society the room to maximize their talents and expand their options. Brooks's point is very simply this, is that you don't have to go back but really a century or so in our own nation's cultural history to find out that the way in which people thought about family has radically changed from now. Uh, and, and I actually don't think I first noticed this until Ginger and I started having children of our own. And, you know, I kind of had a sense of what my job was at the office, uh, but I was always plagued by sort of a latent sense of guilt every time I'd pack up and head to the office every day. The reason is because there would be those occasions when Ginger would have to leave town and I would have to fly solo on taking care of the kids myself. And I just seemed to find that, like, her job was way harder than my job. And, of course, in the midst of that, I started looking at my office as kind of a safe place to hide. Am I right, gentlemen? And so it was some way in sort of a, a, a sharing some of these ideas with a friend of mine years ago when he uncorked what I thought was a fascinating thought. Because he explained, he said, look, Les, prior to the Industrial Revolution, it was very normal in most households to have had multiple generations of women living under the same roof at any given time. Of course, it wasn't just made up a family of husband, wife, and X number of children. There were generations alongside that would help in what is the Herculean task of trying to bring up a family. And for whatever reason, our culture has drifted into what we have now, which is, well, it's different than what we had. Than what we had. So you bring up this sort of conversation at a dinner party, and all of a sudden you're going to watch the sides sort of form, as we are wont to do in our world these days. Uh, the more conservative of your friends are going to step up and say, well, you know what, let's have a family values discussion. Because as soon as we took prayer out of the schools, that was the moment in which our, the, 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 the conservative family sort of fell off to the wayside, or something to that effect. Uh, your other more left-leaning progressives in the room will say something like, well, seriously? You're going to have a talk about the family, those, those oppressive patriarchal systems of the past? Don't you know how abusive those things were? No one can say what a family is anymore. A, a family is any group of people who gets together and wants to call himself a family. And look, I hope you've grown accustomed to me now saying uh, that God's word is neither conservative nor progressive. He is neither Democrat nor Republican. And so just for the sake of discussion, I want you to know that the generation up and coming, however, probably falls into more of that progressive sort of framework of mind. I read one writer who put it this way. He said, the upcoming generation believe now in the self-made man, the buffered self, the isolated individual. Every man is an Adam who molded himself from the dust, embarrassed by the belly button that bespeaks his dependence. 
<laughs> That's a great sentence. Choice is the foundation of all moral action, and nearly any act is sanctified by consent, the magic word of the liberal order. But the fifth commandment explodes satanic myths of self-creation by teaching, listen to this, that unchosen relationships have moral weight. Isn't that amazing? Unchosen relationships, just because you were born into them, bear the weight of God's instruction on them. I love that line. The reason is because the Ten Commandments are going to assert that the family, its nature, its structure, its power, all of it is imprinted on your spiritual DNA. Because the Ten Commandments are not just God's ten laws you know, to sort of keep his subjects from getting out of hand. Rather, it's the manufacturer's design for our humanity, the moral arc of the universe, as we've been saying. Think of it in terms of an ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a, a biological community of interacting organisms. So, you know, in the last 50 years or so, ecologists have discovered that these, these ecosystems can be remarkably fragile in their existence. You can imagine a corporation who finds out that there's a bug that's keeping them from being able to develop their land, and so they develop a pesticide to sort of destroy that bug. But the problem is that bug actually was helping to control another pest, which was worse than the first. In other words, there's this whole chain of interdependent things that make up an ecosystem. And my premise this morning is simply that the Bible teaches that legitimate authority structures, including and especially the family, are as vital to our humanity as those elements within an ecosystem. And almost every bit as fragile. And so we tread on difficult ground when we get into our families, do we not? But as usual, God gives us great guidance as a faithful lamp to our feet on how to navigate them. So I just want to throw out three ideas about the family this morning. I want to look first of all at the permanence of the family, the posture of the family, and then finally the power of the family. First of all, the permanence of family. Um, before we get into that too deeply, notice that we've come to a little bit of a turning point in our study. Because the first four commandments deal primarily with our relationship to God, the vertical importance. But our, the last six deal with our relationships to each other, horizontally speaking. A great example is what Jesus, the conversation Jesus has in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36 and following. When a, uh, somebody comes up to him and says, Teacher, what is the great command, greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now look, do you notice what Jesus is doing there? He's bringing out this fascinating feature of a Christian worldview by saying this. Love for God necessarily precedes every other priority. It's rooted there. The vertical precedes the horizontal. This is why C.S. Lewis would go on to talk about the importance of acknowledging a God-centered life if you're ever going to understand what it means to be a Christian. He says, when we have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall, learn, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. But insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving from a, to a state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but rather increased. Now, I've actually done versions of that quote before, so I don't think that's a big mystery to you. But what I do think we also tend to miss, though, is that when we say that we love God, invariably it has to come out in a love of neighbor. Invariably. There is no such thing as concern for God that ignores the complicated relationships with other people and other human beings. As a matter of fact, the Bible will even evaluate your love for God by the way and the manner and the quality of your love for the people around you. You could even understand how seriously you take your relationship to the invisible God by how you deal with the complicated nature of the visible relationships you have here. 
This is what John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 is saying. If anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen, he cannot love God whom he has not seen. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Do you see the connection? They can't be torn apart. So what does that have to do with the fifth commandment? Well, I would say that you ignore the deep personality-forming power of the family to your great peril. I think that's the lesson. Any change in this great central element of your spiritual ecosystem, honestly, it has the power to throw almost the entirety of the rest of your life into dysfunction, does it not? This, I think, is what the command means when it encourages us, encourages us to honor so that, quote, your days may be long on the earth. It's actually Paul's quote from Ephesians 6, 3, when he says, this is the first commandment with a promise. And it's not saying that, you know, the good kids live a long time. What it's saying is that when a society honors legitimate authority, it flourishes. It thrives in a way in which that institution is threatened. And I said this a little bit last week, but it's worth saying again, aren't you amazed that this makes it into the same list as murder and adultery? Which, which means that a society that encourages the dishonoring of legitimate authority will eventually morph into something that is every bit as cruel and tyrannical as a society that encourages raping and, and pillaging. Family, family, even though it's so frustrating, and so frustrating that honestly, there's a temptation just to walk away from it, is there not? To abandon it, to bury it deep. To ignore it. And you don't realize. Your life sneaks up on you, does it not? You can look back and realize family resentments can go on for decades in the life of the average person. But look, the structure of the Ten Commandments themselves are telling you that when you try to ignore this soul-shaping reality of your family of origin, you not only threaten your apprehension to the relationship of your, of your family, but you do to your relationship with God. It's all so interwoven. I realize that for many of you, you're still angry at your parents. And what's interesting is, I've listened to your stories, and honestly, you probably had a good reason to be so. But here's the thing. You have to realize that as long as hatred and resentment and bitterness define that relationship, your parents will still continue to control you. I heard one minister years ago who was talking about taking a uh, sort of a neighborhood canvas where they were going to invite uh, people to vacation Bible school. <laughs> and on one door that they knocked on, there was a man who answered and said, there is no way I'm making my kid go to vacation Bible school because you want to know why? My parents made me go to those things all the time and I hated it. Slams the door. The pastor said that as they walked back away from the house, they thought to themselves, isn't that interesting that with all that resentment built up, they're still controlling you. Because suddenly, you're not going to allow your children to be exposed to something that might be a blessing to them. All because your parents are still pulling the strings, aren't they? So it doesn't matter whether you had a wonderful family or one that you can't stand, that family imprints itself on us and they cannot be ignored. That's what I mean by the permanence of the family. Secondly, though, I want to look at the posture of family as the second point. Uh, because the key to unlocking this command is that word honor. Uh, and on this case, it's actually good to know what the Hebrew word is behind that word. And it's the Hebrew word kavod. Kavod, when you literally translate it, simply means to add weight to. The Bible says we are to give weight to our parents, heaviness to our parents. And what that means is, is that the voice of our parents always has to be taken seriously. They always have to have a voice. So the purest breach of this is to write your parents off. That's the purest breach of this. And so I found it interesting. Every commentator that I consulted agreed that there's so much wisdom in the Bible here because the command is not given to obey your parents, nor does it command us to be thrilled with our parents at all times. In other words, the Bible doesn't root this command in our affection for our parents. Now, look, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute. It does say obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Isn't that Ephesians 6, 1 that Paul says later on? What's interesting about that word, though that word translated children there, means little children. 
Okay, so do you see the Bible's nuance? Early on in one's upbringing, the Bible's command to little children is to do whatever your parents tell you as long as they don't ask you to sin. But here's the deal. As you grow up, there's a real sense in which it would be wrong to obey your parents at every turn. Absolutely it would. Why? Because here's the deal. And children of parents, which is everybody, in your best moments, your parents were raising you to leave them. Again, it's very hard in the midst of all the empty nest syndrome, which, by the way, lives in my house terrifically. It's very easy to forget Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife. Our children are raised to, to leave us. They go out into the world. They move out. They go do those things. But if they're still dependent on me, I missed something in that upbringing, did I not? In other words, I think there's just as much pathology in a family where you're so dependent on your parents for approval and relying on them, every bit as much as those who live in an open defiance of them. And so the fifth commandment comes along and says, honor them. For the rest of your time, as children of your parents, give weight to their words. doesn't mean you accept it all, but it means I give weight to it. I consider it. I think actually there's this sort of strange connectedness that families have. Because if you think about it, every parent is themselves a child. Your parents made an equally powerful imprint on you every bit as much to the degree that you will on your children. Which, by the way, that one little notion alone should free you up, shouldn't it? I had a friend of mine who used to say, Les, get over it, man. Your children are going to have to forgive you for the way you raise them. Full stop. <laughs> no matter what kind of parent you were, that cannot not happen. And so what happens, what that means then, is how I learn to honor my parents is going to come out a lot in the way that I parent. You know this intuitively, don't you? And I think what's fascinating about this is that one of the ways in which we know how to honor our parents when the way it comes out, we'll say, well, do I know how to little h honor my children? I think one of the best questions you can ask as a parent is this question of, how do I honor my children? I think you honor your children by making your goal in your parenting to simply know those people, to know them, to, to investigate them, to work against the, 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 the impulses inside of my heart that want to freak out at the slightest mistake that they make. To lighten my touch on them enough so that I don't put any impediment in the way of simply enjoying their presence before they slip through their fingers and go to this place called Ole Miss. My children are three miles away from my front door and I'm still suffering from it. Ugh. Look, here's the point. I don't think children are clay to be molded. They're not enemies to be tamed. They're not projects for you to manufacture. They are people. How is that manifested in our parenting? One last thought before we move on to the last point. I do think it's important for every Christian to remember that as we honor the family, we also honor the God behind the institution who made the families of the earth. And this is the reason why Christians have historically understood that this command is not just talking about mommies and daddies and children. It's also talking about all human authority, whether it be municipal or federal, governmental, whatever. Christians have always seen society as essentially being a family. It's always been the way we look at it. The family of God, of course, is the body of Christ, the, the church. But Christians within that civil society, influenced by Christians within that culture, seek to mirror on earth as it is in heaven and end up seeing their neighbor as their brother and sister. That's a Christian notion. That we look and say these governmental authorities that are there behind all the human societies are there and can be honored as them. What that means then is the Bible looks and says, you are therefore to continue to give weight to those that are set in authority over you. Christians are constantly being encouraged to be productive members of the human family, whether someone names the name of Christ or not. And in that notion, by the way, you can find a great incentive to serve, can you not? 
Uh, there's a great old story that I looked up from uh, that happened in 1884. A Scottish minister by the name of James Wells told a story about a little girl, a small little girl, who was walking down the street carrying a rather large baby with her. And uh, there were some gentlemen standing around her and watched her struggling with a rather heavy child. And uh, they looked at him and asked her if she wasn't, you know, sort of uh, struggling and wasn't tired from carrying him. To which she looked up allegedly and said, no, he is not heavy. He is my brother. A hundred years later, the Hollies made a hit song out of it in the 1960s, right? Well, what's the idea behind it? That I can serve one another better when I look at you as if you were a part of family. And God granted us that. That's a Christian notion. So the permanence of family, the posture of family, finally, I want to finish with the power of the family. Because look, <laughs> let's be honest, families are hard. They're difficult. And there's a thousand questions that race through our minds as soon as you even say the word family. I mean, how do I love my parents when I feel like I'm in, in a battle with them all the time? How do I deal with my parents who feel like they're always belittling and trying to manipulate me? What are my responsibility to my aging parents as they grow old? And honestly, those questions have got to be worked through with your conscience as you let this command percolate through you. But I do think that it's, it's important for us to remember that because our parents represented God, they really are the ones who set the ground of reality for you. When they approved of you, you felt approved. And so we're dependent in strange ways oftentimes driven to achieve because we're still trying to show them that we can be good. For some of you, workaholism and, and, and marital problems will go back and be traced to a root within problems in our family. And so I think what we have to establish is that whether you had great parents or terrible parents, the only way ultimately to honor them is to know that it's only your heavenly Father's approval that really matters. Look, no parent has ever perfectly loved their children. Therefore, every single person comes into adulthood feeling they've not been properly loved. Everybody. But here's what Jesus says. He says, through me, you can have perfect parent love. There's this wonderful scene where Jesus is speaking to his father in the upper room prior to his crucifixion. And in John 17, he says, The glory that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, so they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. You see what Jesus is doing. Fundamental to Jesus' invitation to the world is to draw you into a family. I want to ask a very unpresbyterian question. Have you experienced the affection of God as being an adopted child of his family? Have you experienced that? Have you can you point to a time in which your heart was overwhelmed by the unconditional love and acceptance of a father in heaven through Jesus? Has that come upon you? Because if you haven't, you're probably never going to grow up. We ne we'll never leave our parents. And it doesn't matter whether you're 9 or 90. Your parents can still control you. If you had good parents and you're still idolizing them and not being willing to ask questions that maybe, just maybe, they might have sinned too. Or if you had horrible parents, you can continue the rest of your life being bitter and weeping over the fact that you can't accept yourself because your parents didn't give you the kind of love that you needed. Either way, our families scream to us that we need another family. And the radical claim of Christianity is, is that your creator can be your father. And because he's your father, he's a good father. And because he's a good father, he can bring healing to a fractured mind to a fractured family, and yes, to a fractured society. Because he made a promise that he would and could. Christopher Nolan's epic movie, Interstellar, has an ex-scientist, engineer, and pilot, played by Matthew McConaughey, all right, all right, all right, who quietly farms with his daughter, whose name is Murph. But devastating sandstorms have uh, ravaged the Earth's crops and the people of Earth realize that their life on earth is coming to an end because of the lack of food. 
And the only way to save the world is for McConaughey to lead a group of astronauts through interstellar space travel and find another habitable planet out there in the universe. The only problem is, in order to get there, you have to travel at light speed. So it takes a week or so of a mission for Matthew McConaughey is decades for his children left back on Earth, including little Murph, his daughter. But there's a mishap on the mission that means that as he's traveling through light speed, he makes these attempts to try to get back home, and he can't. And through this interdimensionality, he starts to watch his children grow up through another dimension, trying to contact them, to, make, to speak to them in literal voices. Meanwhile, the children think that the voices behind the walls are just ghosts, but not Murph. Because so many decades later, after Murph is a very old lady on her deathbed, Matthew McConaughey finally makes it home, still as a young father. But as he approaches her, he walks up to her bedside and he says, It was me, Murph. I was your ghost. And the old lady in the bed looks and says, I know. People didn't believe me. They thought that I was making it up all by myself. But I knew who it was. Nobody believed me, but I knew you'd come back. And in tears, Matthew McConaughey says, how? How did you know? And she said, because my dad promised me. And he ends the scene by looking down at his daughter and he says, I'm here now, Murph. I'm here. But don't you see that it was the knowledge that her father had made a promise to her that one day he would come and draw her back up into the bonds of family, that even the, 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 the constraints of space and time itself couldn't even break down. That gave her the strength to go and to move on and to take up her role in the family of God. One theologian put it this way. He said, because the fifth commandment is the heavenly father's word to his son, Israel, it is ultimately about the father and his eternal son who lives as the true Israel to redeem Israel. So the fifth commandment not only assumes a certain order in society, it unveils for us the inner life of God. The son honors the father, trusts the father, submits to his father, hears his father, gives the words of his father weight, submits to his father's discipline. But this isn't the end of the story. Because in the same moment, the father turns the tables to glorify the son, honor him, and listen to his prayers and pleas. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that what a Christianity promises is to be caught up in this extraordinary exchange between a daddy and his son, between a father and his daughter, to draw up into himself all of his people in family love. And so God comes along and says, I'm going to draw you through there so that every Christian can say, like it says in Psalm 27:10, though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. The power of family is that we are drawn into God and his father, his, the God the Father, and Jesus his Son, into an eternal dance of joy. And that's what empowers us to muddle into our own families and love each other, maybe just a little more. Consider that an invitation. Let's pray. Father, how it would change the dynamic in our families, how it would change the dynamic in our families if we knew that that was really true. Father, if we had experienced it as true, if we knew that you were the one who came down not just to deal with us in a purely transactional way, but to draw us into a place. Father, that's our promise. And we pray that when we come here on Sunday mornings, we might hear that voice more clearly. That you do call us, that one day you will bring us up. One day you'll come back and be a part in it and finish this family, what you've begun in it. Would you do that? Well, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing, This is my Father's World. Let's stand together and sing as we close. This is 
is my Father's world, and to my listening ear, all nature sings around me, rings the music of the spirit. This is my Father's world. What a treat it was to have you this morning. Thank you so much, especially if you're in from out of town and a visitor this morning. We love having you in town, so please come back and join us the next time you make it through. You're always our special guest. Uh, remember, our nursery opened this weekend. If you missed that memo, please tell your friends. We're very excited about it. Uh, we always want to make sure that you've got your little guardian pass, if you can, to go pick up your children. We've got to be a little more locked down about this now that we're getting to the size that we are, but we're thrilled about it. But in the meantime, won't you receive a good word from the Lord? Now may God, our Father, who tends and spares us and who knows well our feeble frame, a Father who gently bears us and rescues us from all our foes, May he establish you like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Go in peace.